Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's, it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. God. I like that. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo and we're back at the yo elliot show uh i'm your host elliot hulse and today we have someone who has made the greatest discovery of our day and i truly believe this uh so much much more so because what he's discovered answers a very deep question I've had in my life for a very, very long time and solves a mystery that I know is not only important to me, though I dove in deep, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but to humanity as a whole. And, uh, and I'm very excited to speak with him. So you guys watched me open up this series, this podcast series with sort of a dump of my level of mastery and the things that I've been searching out uh, since you've known me on YouTube. And so a big part of that was when I shared with you guys character structure, bioenergetics, and some of the work of Alexander Lowen and, and Wilhelm Reich. Uh, Lowen has a book called Spirituality of the Body which might be the peak of his work, but language of the body. And so you guys know that I've been diving into that. Plus, uh, in my search, you've seen me dabble with and go down the line of thought of Osho and uh, active meditation and that there's a sense of spirit in the body. There's something untapped in the body uh, that we're not seeing, we're not honoring, or we just don't know how to deal with. Uh, uh, resourcefully in our in, in our days, anyway. So, uh, bioenergetics, Osho, Lowen, Reich, they all gave me a sense that there's something more powerful and spiritual in the body. And then at the same time, I also had experiences that told me that this needs to be contained in some certain way. This energy, right, as it manifests in the body and all its power, sexual power. And in my search, I not looking to gods or, or, or the God of Christianity, but looking to the God of psychology, because that's where I learned about Wilhelm Reich and also Carl Jung. And Carl Jung was a spiritual-minded guy. Uh, he spoke of the archetypes. He spoke about God, but didn't really say God per se. He gave lots of different uh, Jungian language to this experience. And he was, he was tapped into something there and I knew it was true because when using bioenergetics and Osho stuff and breathing and humping and breathing into your balls, I encountered things that needed to be contained. And I became aware of that by someone using this Jungian word containment. And so that there literally has to be a God, but much more so a pattern that we've been we come from and we're giving instruction 
on how to contain this powerful sexual energy. And so I wasn't looking for the Catholic Church. I was baptized as a Catholic. And so I say today that the grace is kicked in. I don't know. But when I got to a very low point and discovered that I need some kind of containment, the Lord asked me to confess my sins to a priest. And I knew that I could do that, and I went there. And of course, as timing is always divine, in that time of my life, I was picking up the pieces of a former life that God tore from my fingers. And I came across a book that was sent to me at a time when I really wasn't paying attention to gifts that were sent to me. Uh, in fact, I have this book here by Christopher West. Uh, with a letter too, a beautiful, a beautiful card and lots of writing in it as well. Heartfelt, it's beautiful that it has a heart on there, it's perfect. Just so interesting, like, I must have picked this book up about two months, maybe three months after coming back to the Catholic Church. And then to see that this guy wrote a Catholic book about language of the body. And so I can't take credit. This is totally divine. But this is the greatest discovery of our time. At least my time. It all makes perfect sense. I, like many people, thought Christianity was sexually repressive. But nothing could be further than the truth. It's sexual redemption. And that's pretty damn exciting. <laughs> so that's, that's how we get to where we are right now today, where I'm having a conversation with a friend that sent me a gift that also happens to be the founder of the Theology of the Body Institute, where all this is being taught. So, Christopher West, thank you. I appreciate you uh, for being here and for being here. So, Elliot, I am so pleased to be with you on your show. I've been, I've known of your work from probably about 2015 on. My son had discovered some of your YouTube videos and uh, shared them with me. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this guy is so excited about the body and masculine energy. Uh, I wish he could discover John Paul II's theology of the body because I think it would blow his mind. And so I don't remember exactly when I sent my book to you. Um, is there a date there? On yes. Tw yep. 2017? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's April 18th. So eight days after my birthday in 2017. In 2017. Wow, wow, wow. So, you know, I send my book to lots of people, but not lots of people read it. So I'm glad you actually picked <laughs> it up and and read it. And I'm, I'm glad it had such an impact because it has uh, this teaching, which is not my own, really. I'm a translator and an interpreter for a popular audience of a very scholarly work by Pope John Paul II called The Theology of the Body. Right? My mission in life is to put that in language that normal people can understand. And when I discovered that teaching, gosh, 30 years ago, I discovered this teaching in 1993, and it, it rocked my world. Uh, I knew then, when I was 24 years old, that I was going to spend the rest of my life studying this theology of the body and sharing it with the world. And I've had the honor and privilege of of traveling the globe and and just sharing this vision and it's it sparked something of a a new kind of of sexual revolution so that's been that's been very exciting for me i i never ever would have guessed that this was what i was going to do with my life uh, when i discovered this teaching as a 24 year old i was actually pursuing a rock and roll career um I, i'm, I'm <laughs> a musician sense. that yeah, that's what I was doing, and um, my life went in a totally different direction. And I couldn't be more pleased, Elliot, that your life and my life has has inter have intersected. We're both really rock exciting. stars. <laughs> that's why this works. Maybe that's the only reason why we understand this stuff because you were in your body. That's right. That's what music is, right? Music is a resolutely physical reality, but 
It gets us in touch with profoundly spiritual realities, right? Yeah. So we have the touch point right in music of the physical and the spiritual. Wow. I mean, if you get me started here, I'll just keep going. But think about this. What are you hearing when you hear a violin melody that brings you to tears? What's happening? Vibration. Someone is taking hairs from a horse tail and, and rubbing it over right. sheep guts. Right. And, and we're weeping. And, and sound vibrations are going through the ear, through the air and rattling some membrane in our in our inner ear. Right. And now we're weeping. Right. What is that? It's right. the touch point yes. of the spiritual and the physical. That's right. That answers so many questions. That solves so many problems. Being able to it creates so much beauty, art, music, when we could tap into that place it opens the divine exactly and if we were to put a word to it you know i'm a, i'm a catholic theologian right um so if i were to put a theological term to it what we're talking about is sacramental reality what does uh, that mean yeah it means that physical things reveal spiritual things right Right? If we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the spiritual sense of smell, the spiritual mm -hmm. sense of taste, physical realities open us to spiritual truths. Mm -hmm. That's called, in Catholic theology, that's called sacramental reality. As opposed to profane yeah, reality. Exactly, exactly. The profane, in fact, if you pick that word apart, profanum, is the Latin, and it means to bring outside the temple, to have it in front of the temple. Right. Right. When you profane something, you're taking something sacred that belongs in the temple, and you're taking it outside of the temple. And this is going to tap right into what is my specialty is human sexuality, right? Right. Pornography is literally a profaning of sexuality, right? Because sexuality is something sacred. Right. And pornography profanum, it takes it outside of the sacred space. Could I just add to that that every aspect of our modern sexuality is profane? It, for the majority of us. Yes, uh, yes. It, it's yes. hard to make even marriage sacred. It was so amazing to listen to your talk. Uh, so when, the book I listened to before I got here was the body tells a story, our body tells God's story. Yes. I had it here, but yeah, our bodies tell God's story. And it solved even something uh, that was very dear to my heart, which is sex in marriage. I'm a married man. And how even though it's in a sacramental union, it could be profaned by the way we use it. So, you know, even in the sacred realm of sexuality, it's abused, it's misused, it's misunderstood. You know, this, a lot of this for me is understanding and learning. Uh, you talk about contraception, and I get it. Like, I knew before, I just, I, I think I heard it from Catholic teaching, that contraception opens like, that's the, that's the first demon to let the rest of them in. And when a society mm. uh, allows contraception, like ours has done, it's just a domino effect of sexual profanity. Yes, yes. If And, and let's look at that. When you render your genitals unable to generate, you're throwing all of that sexual energy back on itself, right? The sexual energy in us is meant to go out of ourselves to become something constructive, beautiful, life-giving, right? When we, when we render our genitals unable to generate, we're clogging up the system. It's, it's like we're putting a cork on it. We're throwing it back on itself. And, and the goal of sex is no longer establishing family bonds. When you render your genitals unable to generate, the goal of sex is now reduced to pleasure. And there's nothing wrong with sexual pleasure in itself. But when you reduce the sexual act, when the goal becomes pleasure, then other people become means to your pleasure or your displeasure and you're no longer or well it brings lots of displeasure right. in the end in it brings society. misery right you get a short-term satisfaction i get to 
you know, indulge in my selfish pleasure, but I'm doing it at the expense now of someone else. I'm using another person rather than loving another person. And then the bonds of sexuality, which are family bonds, begin to break down. And this is what we've just lived through over the last 50, 60 years wow. since the introduction of the pill. We've lived through the disillusion of the family bonds right. that hold relationships together. I can't believe it's only been 50, 60 years. Like, this is a brand new strike. It, it is. You're, you're exactly right, Elliot. And, and I mean, it's, it's a spiritual battle, it's really. It's the only world I know. And, you know, I grew and up in if the I 80s. may say... Say that again. It's I grew the up only in the world 80s. You know. It's the only world I know. You know, it's just a little profound to me that, like, I was born into this sin such that I have to learn backwards what was before this world that I got into because sexual profanity is just so omnipresent. Yes. It's, it's impossible to understand the sexual revolution without understanding the role that rendering our genitals unable to generate has played. That's the root. Right? If you want to understand why we don't understand what a man is and what a woman is in the Amen. world today, <laughs> the first attack against gender is contraception. Because look at the very word gender, right? The root of the word gender, we see the same root in words like generous, generate, progeny, genealogy, genetics, genitals, right? That Greek root gen, it means to produce or give birth to. Before the modern world ruptured the word gender from our bodies, from our genitals, everyone understood that gender means the manner in which you generate new life, right? And that's determined by your genitals, right? The male gender's genitals generate new life with sperm. The female gender's genitals generate new life with ova. And you need both for the next generation to come into being. If you want to cause total gender confusion, then convince the culture that what they want to do in order to have fun and have more sexual pleasure is render their genitals unable to generate. That's the original gender confusion. That's the original attack against gender. And we are reaping all of that confusion in our world today. We don't, we don't even know what a man is anymore. We don't know what a woman is anymore because we, we view maleness and femaleness through condom-colored glasses. Degenerate right? and, eyes. Ex exactly. Right. We just we used to call this the facts of life. Right. But right. have you noticed in the world today, the facts of life are entirely up for grabs. Right. right. How did we get here? A culture that fails to reverence the fact that genitals are meant to generate will eventually degenerate. And that's the world we live in right now. Amazing. That is the most discovery, most important discovery of our time. A part of it, anyway. And, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not a discovery of our time, actually. It's a rediscovery. Uh, Christians right. and, and wise men and women around the world, not just Christians, have understood right. that the power of our genitals to generate new life is what organizes society. Right. And, and, and let's look at that word, organize. What does that mean? Notice, men and women are literally organized for each other because we have the sexual organs that go together. I love it. Right? <laughs> that's the that's the fundamental organizing principle of any society that in all of human history has flourished. It's based on sexual organization. The male and the female sexual organs go together. It's too obvious. When it's it's so obvious, unless you're viewing it all through condom-colored glasses. And then the fundamental organizing principle of society evaporates. And what happens as a result? 
the whole society begins to collapse because the fundamental building block of society is the family founded on the organization of male and female for each other. Their genitals are meant to generate. It generates the next generation. That's the fundamental cell of society. But all of this, we become blind to it when, when we, again, when we look at the world with, with condom colored glasses. Right. And, uh, I think it would be said that we have darkened intellects as a result because we can't even see these things. To, to even suggest that we've gone awry is to uh, call condemnation down upon yourself. And these are such right, basic right. things. We're the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. If I may quote from my favorite man who ever walked the face of the earth, Jesus Christ, he says, they look but they do not see, right. right? We've been trained to look at the body, but we do not see the meaning of the body, right? It's, it's kind of funny because in some ways we do see the meaning of our bodies. Like we look at our eyes and we know that eyes are meant for seeing, ears are meant for hearing, lungs are meant for breathing, right? We, we know these things, but we look at our genitals and we're like, huh, what am I supposed to do with that? We, we've forgotten that genitals are meant for generating, right? Genitals are designed to generate. When we reverence that, we bring life to the world in a, in a sacred way. When we reverence it in a sacred way, life is seen as a gift. And when we order our sexual choices towards reverencing that gift of life, society flourishes. When we, when we make sexual choices based on what I get out of it, well, then I end up treating others as objects for my selfish pleasure, and our re relationships start to degenerate. So I'd like to back up for a moment and talk about your discovery of Pope John Paul II's theology of the body. And because I know that everything that you're speaking of comes out of his teaching as a very recent pope, uh, interestingly, uh, about the time that the sexual gen uh, revolutions, its, its seedlings started, right, in the 1980s. But of course, you know, it started back in the 1960s and so forth. But he was our pope, I think, towards the uh, around that time, like when that curse came upon us and gave us this most important discovery of our time because it is the antidote to the curse of the sexual revolution at the same exact time. And you've become an expert in that work. I'd love to have you share about your discovery of that, what sent you in search of it, and um, yeah. and more about the theology of the body as a Catholic teaching. Yeah, to, to answer that question, I have to take you back to 1978, when three very significant things happened in my life in 1978. I was in third grade, and I was lying in bed one night, and I heard Bruce Springsteen on the radio singing his 1970s anthem, Born to Run. And this song cracked something open in my own heart. Springsteen taught me how to yearn. He taught me how to feel this deep ache inside. And I don't, are you familiar with that song, Elliot, Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen? Yes. Yeah, so he's, he's on this journey. He's looking for this thing. He's running after this fulfillment. And he's running after it with a girl named Wendy. Now, little did I know in 1978 that 17 years later, I would marry a girl named Wendy. <laughs> this song was like a prophecy of my whole life. And at the end of this song, Springsteen says to Wendy, Someday, girl, I don't know when we're going to get to that place where we really want to go and we'll walk in the sun. But till then, tramps like us, baby, we were born to run, right? And then he cracks open his rib cage and he lets this cosmic cry come out of his heart. He, he's just moaning. It's like this wail, like a, like a, a, a deep groan from his heart, you know, the it went something like, a, whoa, 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 whoa,
oh, what is happening to me? <laughs> like, like the ceiling in my bedroom just split open and, and like this shot of lightning from eternity cracks open my, my, my chest. And I thought to myself, whatever Springsteen wants, I want it too. So it started me on this, this journey, this quest for fulfillment. But sadly, I was raised in the Catholic Church in the 70s and 80s, and, and the, the basic message in the air was your desires are bad, right? You, you need to repress that. You need to follow all these rules, and you'll be a good, upstanding Christian citizen. But man, I, I had this hunger in my heart. I was looking for something. The second thing that happened in 1978 that was just as impactful as Springsteen was when the nuns rearranged the classroom, and finally, I had been waiting since kindergarten for this to happen, but finally, Stacy Reed is sitting right next to me. <laughs> and, and my heart just started pounding because I had this thing for Stacy Reed. And, and I was overwhelmed by these feelings, by these emotions, by these, these desires to be close to her. But again, the message in Catholic schools of the era was, you know, that's bad, repress it. I was raised on what you might call the starvation diet gospel, right? Your desires are bad, repress it, follow the rules. But I'm a man of hunger. I'm a man of yearning. I'm a man of desire. So I became a quick convert in my teenage years. Now we're in the 80s. I became a quick convert as a teenager to what I call the fast food gospel, which is the secular culture's promise of immediate gratification for that hunger. And I don't want anybody to lie to me here. The chicken nuggets taste really good going down, especially when you're hungry. But follow that metaphor, and what's going to happen to you if your steady diet is chicken nuggets and Big Macs? Eventually, the grease and the sodium is going to catch up with you. So that's a picture of me in my, my college years. And I'll tell a, a story that that really changed my life. Um, in 1988, I was a freshman in college, and um, my roommate came back from a party, very drunk, vomited all over our dorm, and it smelled so bad I had to go find somewhere else to sleep. So I grabbed my pillow, grabbed my blanket, checked some doorknobs in the hall. I finally found one that was open. I went in that dorm room and put my pillow and blanket on the floor and tried to go to sleep. Well, this guy comes back from a party with a girl, didn't know I was there, and proceeded to try to have his way with this girl. And I have to apologize to any woman who, who hears this story that I did not get up and kick the living shit out of this guy which is what I should have done, because she said no. She said, I'd only want to do this if I knew you loved me. To which he responded, I love you, I love you, and proceeded to have his way. And I was frozen. I, got, I was so stunned by what was happening, I, I, I froze in my tracks. I regret that deeply. That experience haunted me. And it compelled me to ask some really big questions. So I was, I was really wrestling with this question, what is it in us as men that can lead us to treat a woman as nothing but a thing for our selfish pleasure? And the more I was mad at that guy, I had to look at my own heart and say, am I much better, right? When I'm with my girlfriend, it's not a matter of, of a date rape. But am I much better in the way I think about her, in the way I, I treat her? Am I not also at some level just using her as an, a sexual object for my own pleasure? And it was really like holding the mirror up to my own life and taking an inventory. And I said to my girlfriend at the time, we had been dating for a couple years at that point, I said, look, I need to take a time out from sexual activity because I just got to figure this out. I, I want to learn what it means to love. I want to mean I want to learn what it means really to treat a woman as a person and not just as a thing for my selfish pleasure. And and that journey that I started wanting to understand 
why we have these sexual desires in the first place and how I can use them as a source of, of life-givingness, right? Honoring others rather than using them, loving others rather than treating them as an object. It eventually led me to discover this teaching from Pope John Paul II called the Theology of the Body. And I remember reading this for the first time, Elliot. I was in my early 20s now, 23, 24, when I was reading it. And by the way, that's the third important thing that happened in 1978. Pope John Paul II was elected Pope. And he spent the first five years as Pope delivering 129 talks at his Wednesday audiences, unfolding what he called the theology of the body. And what I learned from him is that Christianity is not a starvation diet. It's an invitation to a wedding feast, right? And I, I learned that the Bible begins with the marriage, the marriage of man and woman. It ends with the marriage, the marriage of God and humanity. And then I realized this is the key that unlocks the whole story. The divinity wants to be one with humanity. And this is who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the marriage in the flesh of God and humanity, of the divine and the human. They became one in the flesh. And I learned that Scripture teaches that the union of man and woman in one flesh is a sign, an image of this divine plan of the marriage of heaven and earth. Can I pause you for a and second? And I learned that... And would you, say that again? Can I pause you for a second and ask, would please, you say do. that the Bible is a very erotic book and that Christianity Bible, is eros, which is where we get erotic. This and this is, is a, Christianity exactly. is actually very erotic. You know, when I was in my search for reconciling these things, I came across uh, Tantra, which we all know to be erotic, you know, spiritual displays uh, in Eastern countries. You know, this is a Hindu thing. And I studied Osho and I learned a lot about Tantra. I could have never imagined uh, beyond what I've learned from you that written within Christianity, there's an eros, there's an erotic love, that, that, that yes, this is yes. Tantra in a Western way, in a Christian way. Well, let me just quote Pope Benedict XVI for any of those who think it's misguided to think the Bible speaks of, of the erotic, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. Pope Benedict XVI says, the Bible uses boldly erotic images to help us understand how God loves us, right? Not only does the Bible begin with a marriage in an earthly paradise, <laughs> and not only does it end with a marriage in a heavenly paradise, right in the middle of the story is this bold, erotic love poetry called the Song of Songs, right? And the Song of Songs, the saints have written more commentaries on this boldly erotic love poetry called the Song of Songs than any other book in the Bible. Why? What did they understand that we need to get in on? They understood, and here I quote again from Pope Benedict XVI. Pope Benedict XVI says, Eros is part of God's very heart. Because what is Eros, right? When you go down the pornographic path, you're going to have a very bastardized understanding of Eros, right? We need to reclaim the profane. What has been profaned, we need to bring it back into the temple, and it needs to have a serious bath. It needs to be cleansed. It needs to be purified. We don't just bring the profane into the temple as is, right? It needs to undergo a radical transformation so that we're no longer self-focused, but other-focused. Because, if again, if I could use the Greek language, eros, a Greek word, is meant to express agape, sacrificial love, right? And the reason, I'm getting this from John Paul II, the reason that the biblical account says man and woman were naked without shame in the beginning is precisely because they, exper they experienced erotic desire 
as the desire to love divinely. Eros expressed agape, right? I, I like to put it this way. I like to say God gave us erotic desire. He gave us eros, that passion, to be like the fuel of a rocket that has the power to launch us to the stars, to infinity and beyond, yeah. right? But it's not so simple because you and I know, Elliot, there is an enemy who does not want us to reach the stars. And his goal is to invert those rocket engines. Right. Right? The guy that I witnessed in that dorm room in 1988 had inverted rocket engines. Right? This right. is not going to bring happiness. This is not going to bring fulfillment. This is going to bring misery. Right. Christ came into the world. This is what I learned from John Paul II. Christ came into the world not to condemn those with inverted rocket engines. He came into the world to redirect our rocket engines to the stars. Mm. That's Eros redeemed. That's a redemptive view of Eros, where our rocket engines get redirected towards the infinite. Right. And that's the only place that we'll be satisfied if we direct it. It's interesting because, you know, in studying uh, Thinking Grow Rich, right? So this is a book that people will use. It's a secular book to uh, help you become rich as a man. And the term sexual transmutation was introduced. And that's powerful. It's useful if you're directing it down here. I've seen it in my own life. Um, it's basically treat your sexuality respectful and direct that energy elsewhere. But to get rich earthly or to get rich divine, <laughs> this is that's right. This is the goal. And so we can Amen. take that same concept. You know, a lot of young men are catching on to, they call it the no fat movement where they're not jerking off anymore to porn. They're starting to really see how bad porn is. We're starting to see how bad promiscuity is. We're beginning to see the ill effects of contraception, uh, but still yet we'll miss if we're retaining that seed and directing it to created things, things that will die, things that are dust. Uh, this is aiming up, and this is why this it's is so beautiful up. that exactly. it's a part of the church. She directs our sexual energy up. I'd like to show you a little visual, if I may. This is a, a painting that my daughter did. I'll hold it up to my camera here. This is called The Three Choices with Eros, mm. right? We can hold it in. This is the Stoic right here. He holds it all in in a repressive way. Most people think this is what Christianity is. Mm. It is not, right? So this is the Stoic. This is the addict who's aiming that energy at the things of this world. Now, let me just pause there and, and yeah. ask, why is that addiction? Let me give you a theological definition of addiction rather than a psychological one. Here's a theological one. Addiction happens, I propose... When we aim our desire for infinite joy at finite pleasure, right? We go and we get that finite pleasure, and we do get a little hit, right? We wouldn't go to these things if they didn't give us some satisfaction, but the satisfaction doesn't last. So what do we think we need? More. Oh. We think we need more. Mm -hmm. Right? When we're in the deception, we think we need more. So we go and we get more. Does it satisfy yet? Nope. So what do we think we need? We go and we get more. We go and we get more. We go and we get more, right? That's why this is addiction. When you aim that energy, and we're calling this energy eros, when you aim that desire for infinite joy at finite pleasure, you end up an addict. But there's a third option. We can learn how to open that energy towards the infinite. This is the aspiring mystic, right? We have the stoic, the addict, and the aspiring mystic. Mm -hmm. This is where real fulfillment happens. And guess what? <laughs> there's, there's, there's an intuition 
in the human heart mm-hmm. that this is what we're made for. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a rock and roller, as I was saying earlier. So I think of rock and roll songs here. I think of, um, I think of the, uh, go ahead, darling, make it happen. Take the world in a love embrace. Fire both your guns at once and explode into space. Cause like a true nature's child, we were born, born to be wild. I want to touch the sky and I'm never going to die. What did Steppenwolf understand in that song? He understood in his own way, that he's destined for this infinite reality. He wants to touch the sky. He's learning to aim those rocket engines in that infinite direction. That's what he's wanting anyway. Whether he succeeded, I don't know. Right. Well, I guess that would be... is, this is what we're all looking for. The next logical question, right? Like, so how do we do that? How do we do that, exactly? Well... Christianity has a term for it, and it's a term that many, many cultures and many religious traditions use, but another name for for this is prayer, right? Prayer, this is what the fathers of the church tell us, prayer properly understood is nothing other than becoming a longing for God. Right? It's learning to open that energy infinitely in an infinite direction and trusting that you're not just throwing it out into nothingness, but there is a God who, in fact, desires us first. Right, Our desire that we feel for some kind of fulfillment is a response to a desire that brought us into existence. And that desire, if we're going to put a name to it, it's it's love. But sadly, that word love has been so cheapened in mm-hmm. our world today. You know, we say, I love potato chips. I love my wife. Well, I hope there's a difference. I love God. Uh, we, we need to make some distinctions in the word love and how we use it. Well, can I pause you for a moment? Please. And say that I would suggest, and I'm sure you would agree, that a part of the perversion of love has been the perversion of sex. Boom. And so yeah. we find ourselves in what we think are loving relationships when they're really sexual addictions. Uh, yes. You yes. know, and this is yes. one of the things that I speak to the young men in the videos that I share and in my coaching uh, is that if you're fornicating, first of all, you know that you're putting yourself at risk. But then how do you know you love this woman if you sought her for sex and that's what's keeping you there? These guys are thinking about marrying women that they've been fornicating with for um, in cases years and so yeah if you really want to love or know if you love that woman it's got to be separated from sex or at least be able to stand on its own yes yes we're, we're putting the cart before the horse right here's what i discovered in my reading of this and study i've given my whole life to studying and teaching this theology of the body that Sexual desire, right? Sexual energy, the desire we have to be touched, to, to experience that pleasure, to experience that joy. It's, it's more than just, I want to exchange pleasure, right? We're, we're looking to be seen. We're looking to be known. We're looking to be affirmed. We're looking to be treated not as a thing, but as a person, And I learned this language from John Paul II, and I'll I'll share it with you, Elliot. He says, the person, the human being, is the kind of being that is indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. I want to zoom in on those three words. Indispensable. Toasters are dispensable, right? When your toaster breaks, you throw it away, right? Toasters are replaceable. You throw away the broken one and you replace it with another. And toasters are repeatable. There are a million of the very same model of toaster at the Amazon warehouse, right? But the human being, and this is distinguishing a thing from a person, the human being is indispensable. 
That's why it hurts us. It hurts us deeply in our hearts when someone uses us and throws us away. <laughs> That's an arrow in the heart because I'm indispensable. I'm irreplaceable. There's no other me. Nobody can replace me because I'm unrepeatable. There's Elliot, there's no other you. There never was, there never will be. Which is why when someone uses you, throws you away, replaces you with someone else, and treats you as if you could just be repeated, like a, like a toaster, the same model of toaster, it hurts you, it wounds you. And the reason it wounds you is because you're indispensable, irreplaceable, unrepeatable. And I want to propose that sex only corresponds to the dignity of the human person, because we're not dogs in heat, right? It only corresponds to the dignity of the person when the language of the body, the sexual language of the body, is saying to that other person, you are indispensable. I will never throw you away. You are irreplaceable. I will never substitute you for someone else. You are unrepeatable. There is no other you, and my love has reached that depth of loving you as indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. I would hold out that that's what every human being is really looking for. And it's the opposite of and what they're getting. In it's our society. The, exactly. I mean, with the dating the, hookup culture, yep. which fornication breeds, which contraception allows, uh, we treat each other as replaceable. Exactly. We're in a throwaway culture, right? It's because we look at the human body, but we do not see the dignity of the person. Right. Right? We end up treating the body as something rather than honoring it as someone, right? And when you treat the body as something, your sexual activity is just going to be usorial. You're going to use one another as long as you get pleasure from it. And as soon as some hardship comes up, you're going to dispense with that person and replace that person with somebody else. And now you're in the, the consumer culture. Right. You're, you're treating a person like an object for consumption. Right. This is absolutely the greatest discovery of our time, you know, because it's not only how we treat each other, in other, in other words, women and men sexually, but even the way we treat other men, right? Like, because now your ability to use and dispense of women now gives me a sense of who you are and I can use your imagery. You become an icon for me for something that That's I right. want to achieve, which is, you know, obviously diabolical in itself. And so the entire society relates to itself in an inverted way, a perverted way, a degenerate way. And so the, That's right. I would propose, and I'm sure you would agree, that to solve a lot of these problems, contraception should be not used. We it, what we have to do in order to understand why contraception is, is such a problem, we have to recover a vision of the dignity of the person, right? It's, it's understanding the value of sex. Uh, the problem, I would say, with the modern world is not that it overvalues sex. The problem with the modern world is it has no clue how valuable sex is, right? Sex is meant to be an expression of the value and dignity of the person as someone indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. When we see that, right, when, we, when, we, when our eyes get opened a little bit and we really see the dignity of the person, we don't want to treat that person as a thing because we don't want to be treated as a mm -hmm. thing, right? But this is the world we're groomed in and, and, and educated in. We think it's all about using one another. And I can just look back at my own life. I'll never forget, I was in eighth grade. I was 14 years old, and I had that kind of first makeout session with the girl, and and I thought this meant something, yeah. and I thought we were going to have a relationship, and she said, no, I don't want a relationship with you, and I said, well, why did we do that? And she said, I just did that so I'd have a story to tell my girlfriends. 
And it was the first time I really felt sexually used. Hmm. And man, that hurt. It wounded me really badly. You know, I'm 14 years old. Uh, it was a deep wound. And I remember like resolving, okay, if that's the game, if that's the way it works, then I'm going to harden my heart. I don't want to feel that pain ever again. I'm going to harden my heart and fine, I'm just going to use people. That's the, that's the, if that's the name of the game, I'm just going to play that game. And I played that game for a number of years and it, it wounded me all the more because you can't really go against the way we're wired. Yeah. We're wired to be loved, not used. And when you play the game of using rather than the game of loving, you really, really hurt yourself. And then you have to numb yourself. You have to, mm -hmm. you know, look, a, a culture that sells you a counterfeit version, a profane version of sex and love, also, at the very same time, has to sell you all manner of numbing agents to keep you from recognizing the pain you're in. Yes. Do you know what changed my life, Elliot? You know that story I told you of, of that dorm room scene that, that rocked my world and, and set me on a, on a journey? What, one thing I didn't tell you was I did a little experiment that weekend, and it was the experiment that changed my life. I decided to stay sober for one weekend. I wanted to go into a weekend in a college setting in 1988 without being drunk so that I could just observe what was really going on because I had this hunch. I was like, why are we always getting drunk? Right. Why do we have to be drunk to have a quote, good time? Are we hiding our hiding from something? Are we numbing ourselves to something? And it was because I was sober that I was able to see my roommate when he vomited in our room, like he's not having fun. I saw him passed out in a puddle of his own vomit. That is not fun. And it was because I was sober that I was able to recognize that that guy and that girl in that bedroom scene, in that dorm room, were not having fun. They were both drunk, and they, they, it led to debauchery. It led to terrible tragedy. I say to anyone and everyone, have the courage to remove the numbing agents from your life because your pain is very instructive, right? If you numb your hand and you, you put your hand on a hot stove and you don't feel it, that's a problem because yeah. you're going to burn your hand off, right? When we numb ourselves with drugs and noise and porn and masturbation and, and alcohol and, and just screens is a num they're numbing agents in themselves when we're constantly sated and and numb to what's really going on we're not paying attention the pain that we're in is no longer able to instruct us yeah and would you agree that the pain that we're struggling with is sexual pain absolutely, absolutely. because even the drinking absolutely. in college you know the whole idea of getting drunk is to then go and get laid the whole idea is to get out there party get hammered yep. and get laid what is why are we even seeking that? Why are we even searching for that? That we have to get numb to go and go to go and do that. It's definitely against our nature, and it's something that we all sense. I, I would I would put it this way: the the proof that this sacred vision of erotic love that you and I are talking about, that we're trying to unpack here, the proof that that is the truth, that that's really what we're looking for is revealed in the wounds of a culture that has rejected that vision, right? The wounds are telling the story, right. and you're absolutely right, Elliot. The wounds are of a deep and profound sexual nature. I mean, we are so wounded sexually that men no longer want to be men. They're chopping off their genitals. Women no longer want to be women. They're chopping off their breasts. Right? What is, wh why are we doing that? I would put it this way We will eventually despise whatever we idolize. We have, ever since the sexual revolution got underway, we've been idolizing sex. Right. 
right? And what do I mean by that? We're positing in sex. This is what the sexual revolution did. We're positing in sex a fulfillment that it can't possibly grant. Because what we're really looking for, let's remember our three options. What we're really looking for is this. And when we think it's this that we're looking for, it can never fulfill. So we go to that idol. We get our little hit. We get our little buzz, but it doesn't fulfill. We go back to it. We go back to it, and it fulfills less and less and less. It's the principle of diminishing returns, right? Any psychologist right. will tell you that anything you're addicted to has a principle of diminishing returns. And that's helpful when well, you're when talking you... about substances, right? So alcohol and, and drugs, but but nonetheless, sexuality, the very thing that makes us who we are and the, and the, and the organization of our society. So we're all uh, sex addicts, and perverted sex addicts. That's right, that's right. And a culture of sexual addiction is a culture of sexual idolatry and we will eventually despise whatever we idolize because the thing that we invested our happiness in will eventually prove that it can't give us right. the happiness we wanted. And then we're pissed as hell at the very thing that we wanted to bring us that great fulfillment that didn't. So then we take out all our pain and all our anger on the very thing that didn't give us what we wanted. And that's the world we yeah. live in right now where we are mangling our own bodies. We are mutilating our own bodies because we're so angry and pained and wounded about this whole sexual conundrum that we've found ourselves in. Well, what is the way out? Ah, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, have we been given this theology of the body of Pope John Paul II. You know, if you look at all of, of Christian history, whenever there's a great crisis in the church or in the world, a great saint is raised up to respond to that crisis. And it's just evident to anyone whose eyes are open, the crisis of our day is a sexual crisis. And I want to suggest that the great saint who was raised up in our day to respond to this crisis was St. John Paul II and his theology of the body. And it's like we have the antidote right in our hands, but it's not going to do us any good if we don't inject it into our bloodstream, right? And, and that's the work that we do at the Theology of the Body Institute. Our mission is to help inject this into the bloodstream of real men and women. And what it invites us to, it's not the teaching that saves us. It's the Redeemer who saves us, right? And the good news is our Redeemer came in the flesh to redeem our flesh, right? What I learned from John Paul II, which somehow got left out of my Catholic upbringing, is that Christianity holds out to us not salvation from the flesh, but salvation of the flesh. This is exactly what we need, right? These sex change <laughs> operations, they're holding out salvation from the flesh, right? Christianity holds out salvation of the Resurrection flesh. Resurrection of the body. Boom. Boom, baby. It's not just our spirit that's meant to participate right. in the infinite ecstasy of God. Right. It's our body. This is why only Catholicism it's could hold this position. Because so many branches of Christianity reject the body wholeheartedly, That's along right. with all the beauty that the church displays. It's a, it's a stripping down. That's right. That's right. And if we are trying to divorce ourselves from our bodies, we can make no sense of a God who wants to wed himself to our bodies. Right? right? It's called Christmas. It's called the Incarnation. Right? God has wed himself right. to our flesh and blood yeah. to raise our flesh and blood up into the divine ecstasy. <laughs> this is your destiny, Elliot. This is my right. destiny, Elliot. Bodily ecstasy to participate in the infinite bliss of divine life-giving love. 
this is Christianity in its very essence, but most people just haven't really heard about this banquet. We think it's the starvation approach. So we right. say, screw that. I'm going for the fast food. That's right. And we are definitely fed on fast food. Uh, you know, one of the challenges that many of the men that I mentor to is porn and masturbation. I would say it's probably the top uh, complaint that I have when men, when I do consultations with men, uh, porn and, and, and masturbation. Could you talk a little bit about, well, what is life like if you stop porn and masturbation? I think we know a lot about the, the negative effects, but... What is possible if you hang that up? Yeah. Well, let me just tell you my own story there. Um, I was addicted to porn as a teenager. And I was addicted to masturbation as a teenager. This is back in the 80s. And when I ended up breaking up from that relationship, I didn't break up with her. She broke up with me. But I, I dated this girl for four years. She broke up with me in the summer of 1990. And, and I had had sexual release. I was 21 years old at the time, almost 21. And I had, I had had daily sexual release from the age of 13, let's say. So for seven or eight years. And I remember thinking, what am I going to do? What, am, what the hell am I going to do with myself? I mean, I, I, I thought I needed sexual release like I needed three meals a day. I just thought, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I remember this ragged prayer came out of me. It was something like, God, what am I supposed to do with all this energy in my body? I, I, I've, I've just indulged in, in selfish masturbatory activity for, for so many years. I don't even know what to do with myself. And it's not like I hear, heard some divine voice or any such thing. But I did deepen my spirit. I sensed this invitation to open that energy just as I felt it. And that's key, just as I felt it, to make it a prayer. And this is what I began doing at the age of 20. I began, whenever that sexual urge would grab hold of me, I just started saying, okay, I, I give it to you. I open it to you. God, are you there? I, I want I want to I want to give this to you. And eventually, as I studied more and came to understand what Christianity has to offer, I realized that there's this principle of death and resurrection that we can really enter into, and that that Christ wants wants what is selfish in us to be crucified so that true erotic desire can be resurrected in us. And, and these, are, these are difficult principles, maybe if you don't have a, a Christian background, but let me see if I can walk you through an experience from my own life, right? So here's a principle. I, I implement it whenever I need to. Uh, suppose I'm walking through the airport and, and I see, you know, I'm passing the newsstand and there's whatever magazine with a woman's breast just spilling over. And I'm drawn to that right away uh, because I'm a man and that's the way I'm, I'm wired. And I find that attractive. And guess what? I'm meant to find that attractive, right? God made a woman to be beautiful. But I also see an inclination in me that I don't like. And that inclination is to treat that person, that's a real person, her photograph was taken, that's a real person, she lives somewhere, she has a mother, she has a father, she has brothers and sisters probably, she has hopes and dreams, she's a person. She's not a thing for me to use for my selfish pleasure. But I see this inclination in me to do so. I can enter in that moment, and I've trained myself to do so with God's grace, to say, to pray, Lord, God, thank you for the beauty of that woman. Thank you for my erotic desire. But I recognize in me something is twisted up. I'm inclined to treat that person as a thing for my pleasure. I give this twisted, selfish desire to you, and I ask you, God, please, by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to untwist in me 
what sin has twisted up so that I might experience the redemption of my erotic desires. I have entered into that. I've trained myself to do that on a daily basis. That would be well worth and memorizing can... as a prayer, men. Write that one down. And I, I can tell you, Elliot, and I can tell all the men listening, I can't speak from the female perspective here, but as a man, I can tell you that that death and resurrection, entering into that, it is real. I know what it's like to treat a woman as a thing for my pleasure, and I know what it's like to have my eyes opened up to see the glorious theology of her body, to recognize that woman's body is a sign of heaven on earth. Let me unpack that for a minute. If Christianity is real, if Christmas is real, if the Christmas story really happened, if a woman really became pregnant bodily with a divine person, Jesus, if Jesus is really God, if a woman was really pregnant with a divine person, then we have to conclude woman's body became the dwelling place of the Most High God. In other words, woman's body became heaven on earth. That's the theology of a woman's body, right? Her the, the theology of a woman's body is she's the temple. She's the dwelling place of the Lord. Would you say that Mary redeems women in a way? Mary is the redemption of mm. woman. She's not the redeemer of woman, but she's the redemption of Amen. woman. Right? Right? Christ is the redeemer of us all, but Mary is the fully redeemed woman. Right? She is what woman is meant to be. Every woman shares in the dignity of Mary as heaven on earth. And if that's the theology of a woman's body, well, then what's the theology of a man's body? All right, here we go. Guys, take a look at your body standing there in the shower. You are designed by God with utmost reverence, with great love, with the very love of God. You are designed by God to enter the gates of heaven. That's the theology of a man's body, yeah. right? To enter the gates of heaven and there make the ultimate sacrifice for the life of others, right? This is the whole imagery of the priest and the temple, right? Only the priest can enter the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of the Lord. And what does he do there? What does the priest do in the Holy of Holies? He makes the sacrifice for the good of others, right? The man is the priest. The womb is the Holy of Holies. And we are designed by God as, as priests in our own right as husbands, to enter the inner courts of the temple and make the sacrifice. This is the theology of the, of the male body and the female you body. You sound like a Gnostic. No, 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 no. Time out. No, I do not. Because Gnostics reject the body, mm. right? The Gnostics see the body as evil, right? What, what we're doing here is we are bringing the body into the full implications of the incarnation, right? The, the male body is the sign that God desires to enter his creation. And the female body is the sign that creation desires God to enter it. Right? This happened when Mary said yes to God's, mar to God's marriage proposal. Mary, God, God defers to our freedom. Think of this. The Creator would not enter His creation 
without the creature's permission. Mary represents all of creation when she says yes to God entering. And here we have a male body, Jesus Christ, has entered creation through the female body. The male body is the sign of God's desire to enter his creation. The female body is the sign of creation's desire to allow God entrance, right? When St. Paul tells us in chapter 5 of his letter to the Ephesians that the union of man and woman in one flesh is a great mystery, I like the ring of the Greek a little better. It says mega mystery, right? Sexual union properly understood according to the divine design. Sexual union is a mega mystery, and it refers to Christ and the church. This is our faith. The union of man and woman is a symbol of, it's, a, it's a, a sacramental symbol of God's union with us. This is the biblical truth. This is what makes our bodies not only biological, but theological. The symbolic meaning of the body, which is to unite heaven and earth. But you brought up this word earlier, Elliot, diabolic. Do you know what the word diabolic actually means in Greek? Symbolic means to unite heaven and earth. Diabolic means to rupture heaven and earth. That's the diabolic one. And check this out. As soon as St. Paul tells us the symbolic meaning of the body in Ephesians chapter 5, The symbolic meaning of the body is to unite heaven and earth. What does he tell us in Ephesians chapter 6? He says, get ready for a war, because the diabolic one does not want you to know the symbolic meaning of your body. (laughs) And St. Paul says, if you want to win this war, you got to put on the armor of God. This is right up your alley, Elliot. This is right up your alley. You know, teaching men to be warriors, This is how we win the war. This is how we win the war. You got to put on the armor of God. What is the very first piece of armor that St. Paul says you have to put on? Do you know? Gird your loins with the truth. I hope you know what your loins are, gentlemen. Sexual mastery, sexual control, self-control. Boom. Are your loins girded in the truth of Trinitarian love, or are your loins girded in the lies of Lucifer's diabolic rupture? And now we're back to contraception. Because what is contraception? It's diabolic, literally. It's the rupture of the union of heaven and earth. Because this is what the giving of the seed in the womb symbolizes, right? It symbolizes the divine seed, right? Do you know, do you know where we get the word testicles? Testament. Testament, exactly. It shares the same root as words like testify, testimony, testament. What is a man's testicles meant to testify to? It's meant to testify to the infinite fatherhood of God. That's what it's meant to testify to. And this is why ejaculating in a condom is diabolic. It's it's fundamentally diabolic because you are no longer symbolizing the infinite fatherhood of God. I mean, let's get let's get even more specific here. A woman, right? A woman's body symbolizes all of creation, which includes us. We are creatures, right? We are not divine. The analogy breaks down. It's not that men are divine and women are are not. Uh, we're all creatures, right? And this is why John Paul II says. 
that woman is the model of the whole human race. Because to be human in its fundamental essence is to be open to receive the gift of God. This is why all of creation is feminine. That's why we're the body of Christ, right? right? The bride. Boom. Boom. Exactly. This is why the church is the bride. And it's also why Christ came in male flesh, because he came to testify to the eternal fatherhood of God. Right? Let's get down to the to the level of gender. Remember earlier we said the male gender generates the next generation with sperm. The female gender generates the next generation with ova, right? When a female child is born, she has all the eggs that she will ever have. And over the course of her lifetime, she will release anywhere from one to four or 500 eggs, one to 400 generally, to, based on how long she lives, how many babies she has, et cetera, et cetera. She'll, we were, she will release one to 400 eggs in her lifetime. Okay. Men produce 1,500 sperm per second. 1,500 sperm per second. Boom. You and I just produced another 1,500. Boom. You and I just produced another 1,500. Boom. You and I just produced another 1,500. In every act of intercourse, in a healthy male, there is some, some, something upwards of five, three to 500 million sperm racing to get to that egg. Right? Three to 500 million. Pope Benedict XVI says that sperm in, in all of creation, plant sperm, think of pollen in, in the springtime. You know, I live in the woods here in Pennsylvania, and our cars and our house and our sidewalks, everything get covered in pollen in the springtime. Plant sperm. Do you, do you know what's happening when you're allergic to pollen? <laughs> Some plant is trying to mate with your nose, and your nose doesn't like it, so it <laughs> sneeze out, sneezes out the plant sperm, right? I mean, it's everywhere. This is the story that creation tells right? And the, the millions and millions of sperm, billions of sperm that men produce, zillions of sperm that we produce in a lifetime is a sign, according to Pope Benedict, of the infinity of God's fatherhood. Our bodies testify to the infinite fatherhood of God. Amazing. This is why our bodies are theological, they are symbolic of the divine fatherhood. That's why God is referred to as father, as masculine. Um, yes. Was Christ yes. the first to call God father? Well, we do have, we do have, there are, the term father does appear in the Old Testament, but Christ is the first of a, as a human being, right, to say God is my father. And to invite us also to invoke God as Father. This is a profound intimacy. And the Muslims are right here to, to say, whoa, time out. That's, that's an amazing, astounding, and they would say inappropriate intimacy to call God Father as Christians do. But I would respond, yeah, you're right, it is bold. It is ballsy. It is intimate. But this is precisely the intimacy that we're all called to as children of God, right? St. John says, what love that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God and that we can call him our Father, for that's what we are right? We have been regenerated. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, this is the entry into the kingdom, is to be regenerated, born anew. And Nicodemus, in that biblical conversation with Jesus, he's like, wait a minute, can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? 
Interestingly, Jesus does not say no, but he raises the conversation to a supernatural level. And he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, if you don't understand the earthly reality, you're never going to understand the heavenly reality. First, we have to understand the earthly reality of union and generation, and then we can understand the supernatural reality of the union of God and humanity and the generation of new children of so God we, that come. We have to understand the physical come to first. Us, boom. The physical points to the spiritual. Right. Understand the natural reality first, then you'll understand wow, the supernatural amazing. reality. And to say that those who, uh, you know, that science is against religion doesn't make any sense. Because if it's it to, to no, know it the no sense. spiritual, you got to know the physical. Science gives, we wouldn't even know, put it this way. We didn't know that a woman produces an egg until the 1830s when scientists had the technology to discover it, right? Up until the 1830s, we thought woman's body was like an incubator and that the male sperm contained the whole DNA of the child and she just kind of incubated it. Thank God for what science reveals to us about these truths, because the more we del delve into the scientific truth, the more we understand the theology of our bodies, because all these scientific biological truths, these natural realities, point to the supernatural realities. So if I could pause you for right? a moment, I'd like to circle back and talk about fathers and fatherhood, because um, in our world today, there's a major defacement of the father. Um, not just masculinity, but an attack literally on patriarchy, the father. Um, how yes, is it yes. that, or, or maybe you could speak to how that is representative of our severing from God the Father. It's like atheism yes, and yes. father hatred are sort of in the same ballpark. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right, Elliot. Um, and let me, let me return to something you said at the start of the show. You said that we as men need a pattern to live by. You use that word pattern. Do you know where we get the word pattern? Paternity? Pater. Pater. Father. Pater. Paternity. Exactly. Pater. Father. God, the pater, is the ultimate pattern by which we are called as men to live our lives, right? St. Paul says this in his letter to the Ephesians. He speaks of God the Father, from whom all fatherhood gets its name. But here's the problem. In order to understand the crisis of fatherhood and why we are rebelling against fatherhood, we have to go back to the fundamental lie that humans b believed in the beginning. And this is a direct quote from St. John Paul II. It's one of the most remarkable things he said in his 26-year pontificate, uh, but it's rarely, rarely recognized for how remarkable it is, or it's rarely brought up by those who study his work. But here it is. He says, this is truly the key, the key for interpreting reality. <laughs> okay, what's the key for interpreting reality? Then he tells us, original sin attempts to abolish fatherhood. This is truly the key for interpreting reality. Original sin attempts to abolish fatherhood. Okay, let's try to unpack that. <laughs> what does that mean? Why does the serpent... Now remember, again, for those who don't have a, a, a biblical background here, or maybe you had learned this in Sunday school, and you thought that the biblical story of creation meant that we had to believe in a talking snake and all these things. These are symbols. The tree, the snake, 
Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden, we have to read the symbolism in order to get into the richness of the story. So let's look at the symbolism of why the serpent approaches the woman. Remember what I said to you earlier, Elliot, that woman is the model and the archetype of what it means to be human, right? Her body reveals that we are called to open to receive divine love, conceive divine love, and bear it forth, right? That's the theology of a woman's body, and it reveals something about all of creation. None of us asked to exist, and that means our existence is a gift that we must receive. A woman's body tells us that story of receiving our existence as a gift and then sharing that gift. The goal of the serpent is always diabolic. He wants to rupture the union of heaven and earth, right? How does the union of heaven and earth happen? It happens ultimately by a woman named Mary who opens to that infinite seed of the Father, right? That's how the union of heaven and earth happens ultimately. Woman opens. She trusted. Mary trusted that God's, that God's very essence is one of love. And so I can open without being dominated, without being crushed, without being used, without being... I, I hate this word. It's a, it's a sharp word. I'll spell it. But R-A-P-E-D, right? We don't want to be raped. We don't want to be raped. The serpent convinces the woman that God doesn't love you. God is not a loving father. God is not a loving bridegroom. If you open to him, he will dominate you. He will enslave you. He will R-A-P-E you because God is not love. That was the fundamental lie that we believed. That's the attack against God's character as loving father. And that's what most men are portrayed as today. Toxic Boom. masculinity. Boom. Don't trust any man. They're going to rape you. Don't trust any authority. That's Don't right. trust any fathers. They're, it's fatherhood and, crisis. And, and that goes... It goes right back to this lie. But let's also acknowledge men will take on, because we are meant to reveal the character of God's fatherhood in our bodies, right? Men will take on in their lives the character that they believe God to have. And if men believe God is a tyrant, they will become one. And there are a lot of men who use their masculinity in that tyrannical way. And so there is a deep father wound in all of our lives. Even if you had a good father, I had a good father in many, many ways. I had a very good father. In many, many ways, I had a very broken father. In many ways, I'm a good father. But talk to my adult children who are already dealing with the fallout of being my son or, or my daughter, and, and they'll tell you, yeah, my dad was really good in this, this, and this, but my dad really messed up here, here, and here because I'm broken, and so are you, Elliot. And, and our brokenness also gets passed along, right? We cause our children and we cause our wives pain, not because we intend, at least I hope I didn't intend to be a, an asshole, but there were times when I was an asshole, uh, when I was a jerk to my wife and to my kids, and that causes pain. So yeah, we have to look, there's, there's a lot of nuances here. It is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. And, and this is part of the disease that we're facing in the world today, to label masculinity itself as toxic. That itself is toxic, right? But if we're honest, we can recognize there are elements of Fallen masculinity is right. toxic, right? Fallen masculinity is toxic, but that's not the whole story. We're all on a journey of becoming the men we are meant to be. 
And as we become more and more the men we are meant to be, we can restore the truth. Uh, my colleague, Bill Dunahy at the, the at the Theology of the Body Institute, he speaks of tonic masculinity, which is a healing masculinity, a tonic that heals, that restores. And we see this perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ, right? His whole mission is to undo the lie that God is a tyrant, that God wants to snuff us out. That's the entire mission of Jesus Christ. What is he saying from the cross? He's saying, you think God doesn't love you? Let me show you how much God loves you. You think God wants to crush you and enslave you? I will take the form of a slave to demonstrate to you that I have no desire to enslave you. I've come to set you free. You think God would whip your back if you gave him the chance? I will let you whip my back to demonstrate to you that God has no desire to whip yours. You think God wants to crush you and snuff you out? I will let you crush me and attempt to snuff me out to demonstrate to you that I have no desire to do this to you. Stop persisting in your unbelief. Repent and believe that God is a loving Father. This and this alone can bring to us the redemption of fatherhood. We have to be willing to take what is toxic in our masculinity, let it be crucified so that what is tonic in our masculinity can be resurrected and can flourish. Would you agree? So that we can become... That a place to begin, that journey would be with sexual restraint. Boom. Boom. And, and here, I, I would use the word self-mastery. I like that. Self-mastery. Only the person who is master of himself is truly sexually liberated. Right? And let me, let me press into that a little bit. Our culture talks a big line about sexual freedom, right? Sexual liberation. But what does the culture mean by that? It means do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, without ever saying no right? Well, press into that a little bit, and what you have is sexual addiction, right? A person who cannot say no to his urge to merge is not free. He's addicted, right? Like an alcoholic who can't say no to the bottle. Freedom is not going to come by totally binging on alcohol. Freedom is going to come by getting self-mastery over my desire for booze, right? Put it this way. Sexual liberation, sexual freedom, is not the liberty to indulge my compulsions. It's liberation from the compulsion to indulge. Because only such a man can be a gift, right? If a man is enslaved by masturbation, what's that man going to do when he gets married? Mm -hmm. His entire psychosexual programming is self-indulgence, right? It's indulging a compulsion that he can't control. What's he going to do when he gets married? He's just going to project that same masturbatory indulgence onto his wife. Can I but back now you up he's for just a using her. And so you gave us earlier yeah. a prayer. You gave us a solution. You gave us an antidote to that problem. And um, and that's I believe that is amazing and that will work and that I encourage men to use it. Uh, the work that you're teaching comes from a Catholic pope. And so yes. uh, what makes what you're teaching so different and so uh, important at this time is that, you know, we're swinging from talk of the body and talk of sex and uh, what sounds like mystical union. You know, I, I used the word Gnostic before, but it's mystical. But we know we have that tradition yeah, in, the, in the church. Um,
the church has gotten a bad rap for at least the image that we got about the church, about being sexually repressive. We think that we think the church is holding this out to us. Just hold it right. all in. Hold it all in. When in fact the church is holding this out to us, the redemption so of erotic what desire. What I what I even wanted to say at certain points is that what you're teaching redeems the church itself. Well, it's not what I'm teaching. It's it's what Pope John right. Paul II well, is the teaching. And believe teaches. it or not, believe it or not, yeah, it's the church teaching. And that's my point. This is this is an organic presentation for the modern world of what the Catholic Church has really believed for 2,000 years. The tragedy is, this is not what trickles down into the common person in the right. pew. That's the right. tragedy. That, and, and that's what I'm trying to be a part of, of rectifying. Yeah. And I'm so shocked that I didn't know this so much earlier, given that it's such an old document. Um, and I wouldn't have known about it if, if it wasn't for you. And so, man, uh, thank you so much for diving into this work. Of course, welcome, you know, I don't Elliot. need to thank you. Of course, this is the Holy Spirit. You got that shock in your heart. And this is where you Amen. were supposed to go. Uh, but now, I mean, of course, I, God gave it to the right guy because you're a teacher. You're, uh, you have an institute. You write books. I mean, there's no excuse for us. You know, if God looks down and is like, why didn't you figure this stuff out? And you'd be like, hey, Christopher West, did you not find him? Look them up on YouTube, right? Uh, I mean, you're really packaging it, and you made it. A, you've made it, uh, or you're making it um, consumable, which is so important. Uh, tell us more about and your there are, mission. There are many others out there doing this work as well. Just, I, I want to say that I'm not the only guy out there doing this work. There's a there's a small army of people who've taken this up and are sharing it, and I'm I'm delighted to be part of yeah, that army. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, and you know, you call yourself a small army. Uh, yeah, I think so, because once again, I got wind of the Hindu stuff, you know, and the Eastern stuff and the, you know, Wilhelm Reich stuff way before any of this. Uh, please, I'd love for you to talk about the mission of your institute and what you're teaching, uh, what books you would recommend or how someone could, you know, we want to live this, of course, and that it's amazing speaking to you in that yes. way. Um, but what if someone wants to learn about this? Maybe they're passionate about what you're saying and they want more information. Yeah, if you want to do a little, um, you know, dip your toe into this world a little bit, what I'd recommend is to go to, it's a very easy to remember website, T-O-B, which is short for Theology of the Body, right? T-O-B for free dot com. T-O-B-F-O-R-F-R-E-E dot -E com and sign up and we will send you three free sessions of the introductory course on the theology of the body that we teach here at the Theology of the Body Institute. And we offer those courses uh, both live in a five-day format and we offer them online in a two-week format. So Again, tobforfree.com. That will dip your toe. You'll, 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 we'll send you three free sessions uh, to learn more about just our methodology and how we unpack this teaching. That's a great place to start. Of course, um, you can go to our YouTube page. We have hundreds of videos on our YouTube page, uh, Theology of the Body Institute on YouTube, or you can just type in Christopher West. You'll get there that way too. My wife and I do a podcast called the Ask Christopher West Show, and we've done about 225 episodes up to this point, and we've, we've answered over 600 questions that people have, all the common stuff. So just dip in there and start listening. That would be another way just to learn more about what we're doing. Um, if you want to start with a book, you could start with Theology of the Body for Beginners. I wrote that for a Catholic audience. The one you said you listened to the audio version, uh, Our Bodies Tell God's Story, I wrote that for a Protestant audience. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do work in both worlds, both Catholic and Protestant. I'm Catholic myself, but a lot, a lot of Protestants are interested in this theology of the body, so I've, I've learned to speak that language as well. So if you're Protestant, I'd go to that book, Our Bodies Tell God's Story. If you're Catholic, I'd go to uh, Theology of the Body for Beginners. 
There's also a Q&A book called Good News About Sex and Marriage. And we sell all that stuff at our website, if you want to go there, at theologyofthebody.com. Just go there to learn more about our bookstore and, and things we do there. Well, Christopher West, with the most important discovery of our time, uh, sharing the work of Pope John Paul II, um, I have a good feeling that this won't be the end of our conversation. You know, you mentioned a five-day workshop. I think and, you're right, Elliot. You know, from our mouth to God's ears, my mom would say, but I, I could see doing a workshop with you and maybe even putting on something together. I would, I would love that. Let's explore ideas. I'm entirely open. The Holy Spirit's doing something through you, Elliot, and I just want to affirm that, and I want to encourage you to keep saying yes. God is doing something mighty in your life, brother. It's re uh, it, it, That <laughs> smile is so beautiful. That is such a gentle smile on such a strong man. It's a beautiful thing to see, and I see right in your smile that beautiful combination of strength and gentleness which is, you know, what are we supposed to be called? We're supposed Tender to be gentlemen, aggressive, I call right? It. Be beautiful. Well, there it is. It's it's expressed in your very body, in your body language. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's yeah, a special that's, gift uh, you it's have, It's who Elliot. I am. I yes. believe the body is the mind. And, uh, and uniting the spirit and the body, bringing God into sex uh, is what I am. And that's why, you know, this is such a... The symbolic... Yeah, it's who I am. Now you have a new word for it, the symbolic versus the diabolic. What's yeah. it going to be? Theology right? of the body. We've got to gird our loins with the truth. Amen, brother. Amen. Can I say one <laughs> yes, more sir. word? I want to say to those men out there who are stuck in porn, that is fast food, and you're looking for the banquet. And I'm telling you, brothers, the banquet exists. Seek it out out seek out that banquet and you will find it the the porn is a diabolic mockery of a heavenly reality that we're all looking for <laughs> like taking that thirst to porn is like drinking salt water right it, it seems that you're getting your thirst satisfied but the salt goes in your system and you think you need more and more and more until your whole system is poisoned and then you die Right? I'm Say that you, prayer. I've been Say there. that prayer. Christopher, would you be willing to close us with that prayer one more time? Because yes. I think it's that important. Yes. This is, the, this is yes. the solution. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the beauty of women. Thank you for the way you've made them. Thank you for their hair and their eyes and their smile and their neck and their shoulders and their breasts and their womb and the gates to the womb and her legs and her feet <laughs> and her whole being, which you have made so beautiful, you have made so attractive. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty and dignity of woman, her body and her soul, because her body is nothing but the revelation of the inner mystery of her soul. Help us as men to hold her body and her soul together. Lord, we have this attraction. Thank you for that attraction. But we can recognize in our broken humanity that that attraction is often geared towards treating that woman as a thing, treating her as an object for our selfish pleasure. We can recognize this twisted up desire in our hearts, Lord. And we ask you, please, by the power of your death and resurrection, to untwist in us what sin and selfishness has twisted up so that we can come to experience sexual desire as you created it to be, as the desire to love woman as you love woman, as you see woman, as your dwelling place, as your temple, as a person who is indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. And I want to say to any woman who might come across this video, please, please forgive us as men for the ways that we have looked on you as a thing, as a sexual object for our selfish pleasure. Please forgive us for the ways we have treated you as dispensable, replaceable, and repeatable when you are indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. We ask, Lord, that a great healing would come to our sisters' hearts and that they would come to see 
the true, the good, and the beautiful in their own femininity, and that they would come to see the true, the good, and the beautiful revealed through our masculinity. We ask for a great sexual renewal that we would rediscover and renew our understanding of what it means that we are men and women made in the image and likeness of God. And we ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this has been amazing. And I'm so excited. I'm excited that I'm just learning Thank about you, you Elliot. because I can't wait to dig in. There's so much. Elliot, I can't wait to learn more about you, brother. And I'm so glad. I, one of these days, you and I will meet in the flesh, and I hope it's not too far in the, in yep. the future. I believe you. And I'm with you. And I love you. And thank you. And I'm with you, brother. Thanks. And that's it, guys. It's a wrap. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery control over your inner punk then listen up if you don't beat drinking drugs or any life draining dependency in 90 days or less not only will my company give you your money back we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice that's what you need to succeed so let's go bro just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done <laughs>